Hi, I'm, I'm Mike Korb. I'm the chair of a uh, past chair of the SME's Pennsylvania Anthracite chapter. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Today is Thursday, uh, uh, September 8th, 2022. And today AMA is recording part two of my research into the 69 founding members. This part two is about 30, the 30 founders that were initiated on this, the second day, May 17th. 1871. September 8th is kind of a special day for me. Uh, 25 years ago, I moved to California. I uh, stopped, my wife and I stopped at uh, Roy Rogers Museum, hoping to meet Roy. Uh, Roy was not there, but I met his son, Dusty. Also, uh, 61 years ago today, in eight, 1961, I became a member of S SME, a AIME. And 79 years ago today, 1943, I was born. So happy birthday to me. This is the second day of the, the uh, first meeting of the AIME was on three days, uh, May 16th, 17th, and 18th, 1871. It was in Wilkesbury, just about uh, 20, 15 miles from where I'm sitting. Uh, there, were, <clears throat> there were 30 members that were elected on the second day. Uh, some of them were attending the meeting. Some of them were were not. I I don't have a real good act, idea of who was there and who wasn't, but I'm just asterisk on this screen of the people that I think that were probably at the meeting. The ones with no asterisk probably were not. Some of them I know that they weren't. Some of them I knew, and vice versa. But so I'm going to just do it in alphabetic order of those those guys. Robert Allison, kind of a, a, a unique guy. He was involved in a lot of early things in the, in the anthracite industry, a lot of it, early things that happened, were happening in the world. He was uh, uh, a manufacturer of, of mining machinery, but before that, he'd been involved as a mechanic, as the first, first breaker that was coal breaker was made, uh, erected in the anthracite region. He also is one of the people that was at the first rolling of the first T rails for railroad that was in Danville. His Franklin Iron Works produced mining machinery used in anthracite and around the world. He was also the first private, private citizen in the United States to buy an automobile. After he read an ad in the Winton automobile, he went to Cleveland and bought, bought a car and brought it home. That car is now in the uh, Smithsonian Institute. Second guy I want to talk about is Jesse Beetle. Jesse Beetle was, uh, was one of these guys that was involved in a lot of different things. He was a mining civil engineer. He was a coal prospector. He was really a pioneer in the anthracite industry. He was employed early on in the, in the 1840s with by the DuPonts in their coal mines in Malkinaqua, which is near the Sus uh, on the Susquehanna River, just north of me. Uh, he uh, opened the Paddy Run workings in in, in Malkinaqua, and as you can see on this map, there's a Beetle Basin actually named for him. He was set superintendent of a mine nearby for several years before and after the Civil War. He moved around a lot. He was, uh, it, this, this map is, is kind of sideways because it's uh, almost northeast, would run north from southeast to southwest to northeast from right to left, but uh, from left to right. He the, the two on the, the two dots on the left hand side were the first places he was, he worked and the ones on the right hand side were the second place where he worked about 55 miles away which was quite a long time this incident at that time those mines on the on the left hand side were Forest City and and Carbondale in Pennsylvania and he was a my my general manager of mines up there and he and his brother explored the, that entire region in, up in the northeast section. He was an expert on coal formations. He works prospected all over eastern and southern states for investors. 
A lot of the founders were, those, were among those investors. His word was taken as fact on almost any prospect. He worked in Birmingham, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, in central and north cent central Pennsylvania. He managed an operation trying to rehab the Midlothian mines in Virginia. His family owned mines in, in Elk County, Pennsylvania. He also was an inventor. He invented a, a shaft bell, an automatic slate picker, and a, and a, a mine, or ho mine horse mule hane, the, uh, the, the harness that went around the mule. He and his brother introduced the first, what may be the first, have been the first exhausting fan in the United States. And his brother, he and his brother-in-law invented the minor safety squib. As Michelle found out uh, after my last talk when I talked about Dado, uh, a squib is, is, was, a, was a thing that, that acted like, a, uh, like the primer for an, an explosion. In 1866, he and his bro brother-in-law opened a minor supply company in St. Clair, Pennsylvania, a factory that manufactured those squibs. There was a store and factory there and for, for years, and later on he lived in his, his, a town of Shikshini. William Phipps Blake uh, was elected to the Mining Foundation of the Southwest American, Hall, American Mining Hall of Fame in 2012. He really was quite a, quite a guy also. He was involved in a government expedition that was, was charged with looking for a route, route from the, the trans, for Transcontinental Railroad. The route to date that they... Uh, surveyed and, and, and recommended was not chosen. It, of course, there was many, many uh, perf uh, competing lines at the time, but they did, they did survey one of those routes. And while he was in, in California, he did a lot of, of surveying of geologic sur survey of West California. He spent a lot of time traveling back across, across the, straight, the United States geologi geologizing he made a lot of trips all through the West and even into Japan and, and, and what was then uh, Russia and Alaska. He's best known as a mining geologist, both in the United States and overseas. He published um, over 200 abstracts and papers. He worked in 15 states, five countries, and three continents. He was a chemist, a mineralogist, mineral collector. He worked for the government. He worked for private industry. He was a mining engineer, mining consultant, and really, really a, a pretty great guy. He uh, was uh, the second territorial geologist for Arizona. Uh, John Frederick Blandy was actually the first territorial geologist for, for Arizona. He graduated from Freiburg Mining Academy. He spent eight years up in the, in the Superior, Lake Superior region. He had several clients up there, including the Rothschilds. He came back to Pennsylvania in 1863, and he joined a little school kill navigation company and railroad. It was, it was the first one of the first railroads in Pennsylvania. Also put in, in a canal that, that joined to the to the to the uh, school kill canal. Later on, he worked in western Pennsylvania, and like I said, he went to Arizona. He was Worked for the geologic survey there. He was the geologic survey there. The first, their first territorial geologist. Next guy I'm going to talk about, I'm not real sure that I know too much about him. He's David Coughlin. I do know that, that he was in working in Scranton from 1866 to 1875. Several times I saw there's mining at advertisements for him being a mining engineer. He well, he said that he was an expert in copper, mining, uh, gold, ores, coal, pretty much a jack of all trades. And I think that this is his picture. I'm not real sure that it is, but this is a picture of a guy that was born in Ireland and migrated to Mexico in 1850. His name was David Coughlin. 
and he was involved there with the Real de Catorce mines at St. Louis Potosi. He was involved with a young woman who had a child named Francisco Coughlin in 1853. Most of this, this stuff that I read there was uh, all in Spanish, and I got to say, I, I lived in Venezuela for a couple of years, but uh, my reading of, of, of Spanish is kind of like, uh, but it, was, it leaves, leaves much to be desired. Anyways, David Coughlin, uh, our David Coughlin, left Pennsylvania in around 1875, there's no record of him here, but there was a David Coughlin that lived in San Francisco for a while. And then back, went back to Mexico. He and his family went back to Mexico. And I'm pretty sure it is the same people. He was working there with his son, Don Francisco. And Don Francisco is a pretty neat looking guy. Uh, there's a map of where Real de Catorce is in, in Mexico. Uh, William Monroe Cordes was a superintendent of mines and smelters in Michigan. New Mexico, Colorado, California. He patented mill apparatus for saving waste in mine tailings. He, he spent five years of his life looking for large pot, deposits of potash in the United States. Uh, spent a lot of time in New Mexico and found some of those deposits down there. In the 1903 AIME transactions, he announced the discovery of a new element in the, in the, that he named amaryllium. However, nobody else decided that it was a one of the elements that it is part of what they call the lost elements. Eckley Britton Cox, as we're probably surprised that he wasn't at the first day of the meeting, but he was not. He was one of the, one of the people that organized the first meeting and attended it for the second day. He was graduated from Penn in 1858. So uh, he went to school in, in Paris and then in, in, in Freiburg. Spent time over, overseas before he came back to the United States to run his, his company's, his family's coal business. He organized that, that coal, a coal business. Before that, they were just leasing coal lands. And in 1871, he was one of the founders of AIME at the age of 32. Over, over the years, he's employed thousands of miners. He was a state senator, a humanitarian, established one of the first miners' hospitals in the, in the United States in 1883, and a miners' fund to care for the sick and injured miners. He was a philanthropist. He created his technical school for miners, supported Lehigh University, and he, his wife, and many of his wife's many charities. He was a fun-loving intellectual. He was president of AIME from 1878 and 1879. He's a member of the National Mining Hall of Fame. And he was also a noted invent, super surveyor and, and inventor. He devised a plummet lamp using a light and plumb, plumb bulb. He, they, uh, he, he also invented the first surveyor's uh, tape measure that could be round on a reel. And his, his surveys of his mines were called the most ex accurate of extended surveys in America. He held more than a hundred other patents and is a member of the National Inventors Mining Hall of Fame for his traveling great furnace, which was a, was a, a invention that that re revolutionized the anthracite industry because it was allowed the use of smaller size coal, and so that rather than the coal being wasted, smaller size coal being thrown away, it was able to be burnt at, and first in the in the in the uh, collieries and then later on in all, all, all other industries and, and homes. Arthur Bryce de Sells was a, uh, was, was born in New Orleans and 
as most people that were born in New Orleans before the war, he was a, he was he served in the Army of the Confederacy. There he was a major. After the war, he came to Pennsylvania, and he had charge of the New York and Schuylkill Coal Company works in in Hexersville, Pennsylvania, around Hexersville, Pennsylvania, west of west of Pottsville. Uh, those mines were owned by Charles Hexer, Hexer and his family. And the Sauls married one of their daughters. He became vice president of Dunbar Furnace in, in western Pennsylvania. He managed the Percy Mining Company there. In 1879, uh, members of the AIME uh, annual meeting were at Pitts, out of Pittsburgh and they spent a day with the Dissolves at, at Dunbar. From 1883 to 1888, he was involved with licensing ring groups, attempt to control the Connellsville coke field, and he for, formed and ran the elephant furnace there in the coke works. And then from about 1890 until 1911, he ran Lehigh Zinc and Iron Works in South Bethlehem, which was also partially owned by the Hexer family. And that, that facility became part of the Bethlehem Steel Works later on. Professor Thomas Eggleston was a mineralo mineralogist working at the Smithsonian Institute. And he suggested that Columbia create a school of mines in 1863. About a year after he made that suggestion, the school opened its doors, and he was a special chair for mineralogy and metallurgy. That's a way to guess. I guess that's a way to get a job. Suggest suggest that somebody open up, so open a business and and employ me. He continued to teach there at Columbia and was made a professor emeritus in 1897. He was president of AIME in 1886, and he was published over more more than a hundred articles in in its transactions. This is a picture of Tom when he was a young guy. Uh, there, there's lot, there's lots and lots of pictures of, of, of Eggleston and all the college professors. Most of the other guys don't have that many uh, pictures, but it seems like the college professors all got their pictures taken pretty often. Uh, Frederick Anton Elliers, uh, called Anton, came to America from Germany in 1859. And he worked with uh, Rossiter Raymond in, in, in New York City. He had later on he had charge of the, a, bit, a copper mine in in Virginia until the ore was depleted. That's a pic, actually a picture of the of, of ore from the from that mine. Uh, Raymond then hired him again. To work with him as a deputy United States Commissioner of Mining Statistics. And they spent seven years traveling, he in Rosser Raymond spent seven years traveling throughout the West, reporting on its mines and minerals. He returned to his training in 1876 and he was part of the Germanian smelting and refining works at near Salt Lake. He moved to Leadville where he built the Arkansas Valley smelter with a picture on the top. And that plant became more what they called a training school for metallurgic training, metallurgy. Many many noted U.S. metallurgists worked there for 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 Eilers. He and his partners later organized the Montana Smelting Company, the, the lower picture in here, and he, which was then purchased and became part of a circle. And Eilers was a vice a vice president and a director of a circle. This is uh, Yellow, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, and uh, a quiz for you. What does this have to do with AI, me, and Howard? Well, actually, maybe you, if you've ever been to Yellowstone, you probably wondered, thought, thought, well, geez, wonder what first people walking through here thought about. Well, actually, there were people, there were, had been no maps made, there was no reports of sewer attacks. 
There's only been one report, one thing published about, about Yellowstone. In 1871, a party of six men and eight horses, one mule and one dog, went off that map and into the unknown to explore what would become, in a couple of years, the first nat nat national park. In that party were two founders of AIME, Rossiter, Raymond, and Tony Ellers. They would actually run into the Hayden Interior Department party and the artist that had painted that picture previously. But it must have been really pretty neat to, for, to have been there, one of those first people there at, at Yellowstone. Another guy that would have had a chance to do that was Percifer Fraser. Percifer Fraser was a uh, professor at, at, uh, at Penn. He was a renowned geologist and chemist, and he had been educated at, at Penn and, and at Freiburg. He had joined the Hayden Survey Party in 1870, but left it shortly after, about a year later, just before it went into Yellowstone. He began teaching at Penn. He was there for 10 years and eventually re replaced his father, who was the head of the chemistry department. He was also one of the key figures to convince the Pennsylvania to support a second geologic survey. Uh, one of the most renowned uh, geologic surveys that surveys that ever occurred. He was, and when his efforts succeeded, he resigned at Penn and went to join that, that, that second survey. The uh, picture on the left-hand side of this uh, is actually the letter of offering him the job. He began his, his assignment with the second survey, mapping York and Adams counties. He spent several years mapping, investigating the economic geology of copper, iron ores in southeastern Pennsylvania, Cornwall iron first, and a lot of other things there, including to the second, four second survey reports. He published 14 other papers concerning Pennsylvania geology in various scientific and technical journals. His monograph on classification coals is, st is still used today to determine the, the rank of coals, the difference between anthracite, bituminous, lignite, still accepted today. In 1881, he became general manager of the mines of Central Virginia Iron Company. And he was a life fellow at the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Geology. The Geologic Sur Survey of America. One of my favorite guys is John Henry Hardin. He just kind of looks like a neat guy. His dad was a member of the North of England Institute of Mining and Mechanical Engineers and was a friend of Professor Peter Lisey, who later became the Pennsylvania State Geologist and head of the sur second survey. In 1866, John Walter Hardin, the dad, brought his four sons to Wilkesbury and established a large professional engineering practice. Edward, Oliver, John Henry, and their dad would all become members of AIME and be active contributing to transactions. The sons also would become protégés of, of Leslie and part of the second geologic survey. One of, one of the and he, he transactions was was that Hardin did was shown here in the lower part of the picture. Composition of maps and relief, making re relief maps and making them in 3D. He did that in 1888. Before coming to America, he had worked in a, as a mining engineer for five years in, in central India in coal mines. In Wilkesbury, he performed sur surveying, shaft shinking, shaft shinking work. He was the engineer for the Empire Mine and chief engineer for Lehigh and Wilkesbury Coal Company. He oversaw the sinking of a six compartment hollowed back shaft, one of the largest shafts in the anthracite region at the time. Work conducted by William Henrik, uh, Kenrick, another uh, founder of AIME. In 1874, Hardin took over the 
father's practice, now, which was now located in Philadelphia. He joined his mentor at Penn as an instructor in geology, and he was there until 1879. From 1879 until about 1904, he was the general manager of the engineering, general engineering manager of the Phoenix Iron Works in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Phoenix had several mines and quarries, including the Boyerstown and Jones Mines in Berks County, Pennsylvania. 1888, he sent a sample to John Birkenbaugh, a future president of, of AIME, who was working with the Edison Ore Mill and Company. The Jones Mine ore had so suffered hard and hoped to be able to remove it with Edison's magnetic sub concentrator that was there at his New Jersey mine. Harden, Burke, and Bile and Edison met in January 8, 19, 1889. And apparently the results were pretty poor because uh, Edison owed him some money, for the, the, him and the, and the Phoenixville company, for some money for about 10, five years. Edison finally set down, set, shut that operation down in 1899, com commenting about his losses, losses, saying, it's all gone, but we had a hell of a good time spending it. I, uh, in my research, I also found these two great pictures of, of, of Harden as an old man. Uh, what on the left, him, him fishing in, in the lower school kill and he had also written a, a, a letter to the editor of the American Angler magazine and I have that pup printed here on on this slide uh, John Rittenhouse Hoffman was the son of Daniel Hoffman who was founder of the AIB was one of the guys for, that were there at the first at the first day of the meeting I talked who I talked about in my earlier talk and I recommend that if you haven't seen it uh, he, he took over his, after his dad as a surveyor. He was the engineer at the Williamstown Tunnel, a railroad tunnel that was 4,000 foot long, driven from both sides and, and, and joined uh, almost exactly in the middle. It uh, opened the Lycans Valley uh, 19, ve 19 veins for the company to mine. And it also opened a another coal field to the north. He later was the, with the Philadelphia and Reading Coal and Iron Company for 40 years at division and a chief engineer. Next guy I want to talk about is William Wynn Kenrick. Uh, I so there was a William Kenrick Esquire who was the operator at St. Clair Connery in 1870. And he was a pretty famous guy in, in northeastern Pennsylvania. So I figured that that was probably who this W.W. Kenrick was. And it was just a misspelling. But then I looked at, further on at a lot of different other Kenricks that I found. There was a mine agent at Windhall Colliery in Wales in 1862. There was a Kenrick who was superintendent of the, at the West Pittston mine disaster in 1871. There was also another Kenrick who was a superintendent at the Eagle Shaft Mine Disaster in 1871. There was a Kenrick that was a shaft sinker in 1871. There was a guy that had a rock drill patent in, in England. He was a tunnel contractor in England. There was a shaft sinker in, in, in Wales. There was a guy that managed a, a colliery in England. And there was one that did a paper on the Danube Coal and Iron company and did surveying there in Hungary. There was one that worked at the great She Coal Company in Nadal. It was actually a mining engineer for the Natal government. And there also was a commissioner of mines for the colony of British Guiana and died there. You know what? It turns out that all except for the St. Clair guy, the first one I mentioned, they were all our AIME guy. At least I'm pretty sure, damn sure of that. William Wynne Kenrick, the son of, of landowning industrialist at Kenrick Dynasty in Wales, founder of Windhall Colliery and a descendant of the Wynne family, was, was managed the colliery, the iron foundry, and the family's lead mine and smelter 
and sometime before his father's death and sold them in 1870 before coming to the United States. The colliery wasn't very profitable. They made about, well, actually it wasn't probably too bad. It was about, they made about 200, 230 pounds a year, but they had to split it between seven family members, which would be about $6,000 each in today's money. Uh, how, in comparison, uh, the, at that time, the my, three miners in, in the colliery together were call, pay, paid 17 pounds, but they had, they actually had to pay 17 pounds for, for powder, candles, fusion, and, and so on. And so they actually end up, they ended up with no money at, at the end of that three months. These are publications about, about the two mining disasters that, that Ken Richards was involved in. The mine at the West Pittston mine disaster and the Eagle Mine Shaft. The one at the Eagle Mine Shaft was investigated by Patrick Blewett, who you may have heard of a little bit. He's the great grand great great grandfather of President Joe Biden. Uh, Kenrick, uh, like I said, Kenrick uh, was the gold commissioner for, for the British colony of, of British Guiana and actually died there uh, of uh, probably of yellow fever at age 55. Uh, Fer Fer Ferdinand Kohner came to America from Prussia as a teenager in 1849. He married a daughter of a wealthy wit Wilkes-Barre Tavern Keeper, became known as a pioneer of the coal industry. He was a coal prospector and a civil engineer. In 1859, he won applause. He was, was note, noted throughout the industry for finding the first coal at the depth in Wyoming Valley. Before that, all coal had been mined above drainage. He passed through seven, 16 veins of coal to a, a thick seam at about 800 foot, feet in depth, what was a Dundee shaft. This is a picture of the Dundee shaft that was remaining in, 18, six, in 1968 before they took it down. Connor was involved in installing equipment at early coal, at an early coal breaker uh, down, at the, down in Gerardville. He and William Stewart, another founder of AIME, who we'll talk about a little bit later, and others founded the Wyoming Valley Manufacturing Company in 1867 to make and sell heavy and light machinery, mining, mining equipment, coal breakers, steam engine, pumps, screens, and coal cars. They actually built the first locomotive in Northeastern Pennsylvania in 1873. They became known for that business, and that business was sold to Vulcan Ironworks in 1888. Corner opened a Sibley Coal Colliery in Old Forge. He was part owner, engineer, and superintendent. Uh, Professor George William Maynard was went to school in Columbia, Germany, and class at Germany. His professor, first professional job was at a at the Connery Mine in Windlow, Ireland. He was look, working on feasibility study for kernel roasting, copper leaching of that treatment of the those pyritic ores. Later on, he was a professor of metallurgy and practical mining at Rensselaer, and also a consulting engineer to various iron and steel works. He, was, he worked as, as consulting engineer in England and Germany, and built mills and reduction plants in Ireland and Colorado and Russia. He was involved in the development of the Thomas Chris, Gilchrist basic steel process in England which made pig iron from ores that were high in phosphorus. He tried to, but, but to it, introduce that here in the United States, but it wasn't very successful. The uh, 
not many ores that, that needed that, that type of a processing. Kelvin Parsons, one of the guys I couldn't find a picture for. I apologize for that. I tr tried real hard. I tried to look, see what they look, each one of them looked like. He was a uh, mechanical engineer. He learned as, as a, an apprentice with the Wyoming Valley Manufacturing Company. Later on, he was a draftsman and mechanical engineer in New York and Rhode Island, and then in New Jersey for, for Edison. And he returned to Wilkes-Barre to work for the Walcott Iron Works. Parsons moved to Scranton in 1882 to work with the Dickens, Dixon Manufacturing Company and also the later with the Lackawanna Iron and Coal Company. In Wilkes-Barre, there's parts of those, or in Scranton, there's parts of both of those companies existing. The uh, Dixon Iron Works at, at the uh, Trolley Museum in Scranton and at the, the Iron the Lackawanna Iron Works in, in, in Scranton. He later then opened his own business and he specialized in inventions. He really was an inventor of, of several important coal machines. He made a, a coal greeter, a a automatic screen and shaker screen improvements. That that invention, that those shaker screens, balanced the moving parts so that the vibration was was not communicated to built it was only communicated to the coal, not to the building. Uh, still used in, in a, a number of, of coal breakers in, in, in Pennsylvania. Professor William Bleeker Potter uh, graduated from the Columbia School of Mines in 1869. And two years later, he became the first chair of mining and metallurgy at Washington University, St. Louis. He was able to move up pretty fast in, in, 18, in the 1870s. He remained there for 22 years while he worked from 1872 to 1874. It's the same time. He was assistant at the Missouri Geologic Survey. It worked as an engineer for Pilot Knob Coke Iron Company. He was a consultant for the Iron, Vulcan Iron and Steel Works. He was chief engineer for the Iron Mountain Mining Company while he was working at, at, at Washington University. While working at the Iron Mount, Mountain Coal Company, he was credited with saving the Elephant Rock State Park. Uh, kind of a a, a really neat place to visit out, out near uh, Pilot Knob. While he was w with a Washington University St. Louis, he also was actively involved in sampling and testing business. He organized and built the St. Louis Sampling and Testing Works and resigned later on resigned his professorship to run it full time. He and the testing works were leaders in getting the city's water cleaned up so that the 2000, 1904 World's Fair could be held there. Potter was also a noted archaeologist, as his father had been, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of works of uh, that he that he pottery and, and that type of thing that he found in the mostly in in the Missouri area in the museum in St. Louis. Now, Frederick Prime, he's probably the only founder that has his own Facebook page. And you can click on that or just type that into your, into your computer if you're on Facebook. And you can find about Frederick Prime. It says, about Frederick, I was a fabulous geologist. I loved role playing, mostly revolutionary battles. I belonged to the Society of Colonial Wars, the American Philosophical Society, and the Sons of Revolution. I'm the proud father and husband. I am a well-traveled man, having been to Germany exploring the mines for four years. I was a social man, and I still am. Well, he has four friends on Facebook. They're all pretty young girls. And I asked to be a friend a couple years ago, and I haven't gotten very much of a response. I haven't gotten any response at all. So I can hardly agree that, that, he's, that he's a very social guy. It's a picture of Frederick when he was a young guy. There's a picture of when he was an old guy. That picture also was posted on Facebook, so I got it. it's got to be true because it's on if it's on the internet. Uh, Prime graduated from Columbia in 1865. He studied four years at the Royal School of Mines in Freiburg. He was assistant professor at Columbia, professor of geology and metallurgy at Lafayette, and he's Pennsylvania assistant Pennsylvania state geologist. He was involved with several iron and electric companies, and in fact, he was the President of the Electric Light Company in Philadelphia from 1891 to 1893. He then became a professor at 
natural history at Girard College where he served until his death. And then Raphael Pumphrey, probably the probably the neatest guy in a bunch, even even more fabulous than than Rosser Raymond. Against his parents' wishes, he decided not to attend Yale, but he went to study and travel in Europe as a young man. He graduated from the school school binds of Freiburg in 1859, and when he came. Back to the United States, he developed silver mines in, in southern Arizona. In 1861, he and William Blake accepted appointments as geologists for the Japanese government. He was forced to leave Japan. He made an expedition up the Yangtze to travel coal deposits and traveled overland through China, Mongolia, Siberia to St. Petersburg in 1865. In 1865, he had traveled around the world working in several countries, uh, that was before he was 30 years old. His life was full of adventure. On an October morning in 1871, he, the same day as Mrs. O'Leary kicked cow, Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over the lantern that destroyed Chicago, Pump Valley checked out some, some of the rocks around him in Michigan, he's picked up a sh spotted yellow rock. Later on, he took that rock to an assayer and found out that what was could be the start of the Gogebic iron ore boom. He had bought about two, he bought about two miles of property on the Gogebic range where the Newport and Geneva mines of Pickett and Smather were built several years later. I don't think that this probably is the real rock that I, that he found, but it's a, a piece of yellow rock, yellow iron ore that I picked up in, in, in that area about, uh, about 25, about, oh geez, 50 years ago now. His life as a geologist and explorer illustrates the growth of geology, what, what has been called geology's heroic age. And there, there's something for the young, young at heart, young at mind, and mining engineer wannabe. The children's book by the founder of AIME. The travels and adventures of Raphael Pumpfeld. Mining engineer, geologist, archaeologist, and explorer. There's, there's about every adventure that you want there. You can fight, he's fight Indians. He travels across the desert. He goes, rides camels. So if, if you're young and have a couple kid, young kids that want to might what? like rocks, get this book and, 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 and read it to them. The next guy I'm going to talk about is Charles Riker. And I know that you're going to be disappointed, but I don't have diddly about this guy. Uh, AME Transactions says he worked for Tacony Chemical Works in Philadelphia. He died in 1876. Uh, it's C.E. Richter in the, in, the, in the AIME records, and I believe it's Charles Edward, but it might be Carl Edward. In, in our ancestries, he got little, not very much about him, except that they, they say he was born in 1841. He died in Philadelphia. Uh, this is a picture of the Tacony uh, Chemical Works in, in about 1871. Another guy that a guy that I do know a lot about, Robert Bruce Ricketts. He's probably best known for his service during the Civil War, where he was in charge of Ricketts Battery. He defended c c the Cemetery Hill during the Battle of Gettysburg. Second day of Gettysburg, he was there. He had enlisted as a private. He discharged as a colonel. Here in northeastern Pennsylvania, he's known for Ricketts State, Glen State Park, one of the most scenic areas in Pennsylvania and land he had owned, in, they owned in 1871, and was later purchased from his heirs by Commonwealth. When I posted this on our, on our Facebook, on our 
Pet Anthracite Facebook page, the Facebook said, my comment goes against the community standards on spam. They would not allow me to, to publish that on Facebook, that Ricketts Glenn was named after Robert Bruce Ricketts, but I'm telling you now that it was. So th this, this, if this is shown on Facebook, it may be banned also. Banned in Brooklyn. Next guy I talk, like to talk about is Irving Ariel Stearns. Irving Ariel Stearns graduated from RPI in 1868. He worked with Richard Rothwell, Richard Rothwell, his consultant at Wilkesbury, and then later on with the McNeil Coal and Iron Company as superintendent. Later on, he succeeded Rothwell when Rothwell moved to to New York as as a as the publisher of the E and M J. Stearns was a consulting engineer, examining mining properties in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, Arkansas, Colorado, California, Wyoming, India, Idaho, and Utah. He designed and implemented Lehigh Valley Railroad improvements in Buffalo, including the canals, docks, and the coal stocking. His prominence as a mining engineer brought him an appointment in 1885 as the general manager of the Pennsylvania Railroad's new centralized organization. Pennsylvania Railroad owned a lot of coal companies, a lot of different coal companies. There are coal companies in, in, in around Anticoke, Pennsylvania, south, just south of Wilkesbury, and down in the in the Schuylkill region, in the western Schuylkill region around Likens. He managed these properties with great efficiency. He made radical improvements in the process of mining and preparing anthracite coal. Among these were the first high-pressure broilers in the anthracite region at Shimokan, the first electric mine locomotive, electric motive locomotive in the United States at the Likens Valley Colliery in 18, 1887, and the first anthracite high pressure compressed air haulage, 1895 up Glen Lyon near south of Wilkesbury. These are pictures of those two locomotives. I believe that the, I believe that the locomotive on the left, the first first electric lo locomotive in the electric locomotive in, in America is currently at the Dearborn Museum of, of the Henry Ford Museum in, De in Dearborn. But I can't find it for sure. Uh, Stearns also managed the Pennsylvania coal properties until 1897. He was selected as resident of the Cox family business after the death of, of Eckley Cox. He headed these organizations until they were bought in 1905 by the Lehigh Valley Coal Company, which he became a director. Stearns was one of the founders of the Penn Anthracite of AIME in 1914. John Henry Spoyer came to Wilkesbury in about 1859 to get into the coal business. He then became involved with privatization of the Wyoming Canal. It was a North Branch Canal Company had acquired a canal along the north branch of the Susquehanna River that Pennsylvania had built. A portion of the canal was sold to the Wyoming Canal Company, and the rest was reorganized as the Pennsylvania New York Canal and Railroad Company. Sawyer was a director of both of those. Then came the Civil War, and after uh, Sawyer served in the Wilkes-Barre militia during the Civil War. And after that, he aggressively came back into the coal business and was a success of it all right away. He was an independent miner, not involved with any large companies who were operated four collieries, the Enterprise, the Wyoming, the Harry E., and the Forty Fort. His obituary casted him as a courageous, whole-souled, generous man, true to his friends and forgiving of his enemies. As an employer, he was a favorite always. You think that pretty pretty nice thing to, to be told. Right? David Thomas was a pioneer of the iron industry in the United States. Uh, probably probably the best known person in in in, in AIME. 
It began in the year 1838. Thomas was 44. He was superintendent of an ironworks I can't pronounce in South Wales. He was respected and comfortable Irish ironmaster with a growing family. Erskine Hazard, the owner of the High Coal Company, came to Wales to upset his way of life. He needed Thomas. He wanted Thomas's Thomas Bross Crane to come to America with his family, erect a blast furnace, and generally give his family his best knowledge and services to the company for five years. Thomas wasn't sure about doing it, but his wife insisted that her sons, the sons needed their, that opportunity that America offered. And when Thomas created our first commercially successful anthracite coal-powered anthracite furnace in 1840, Thomas and his sons started the nation's industrial revolution. David Thomas was also the first president of AIME. On July 11th, 1839, Thomas and his son Samuel, 10 years old at that time, Samuel was later to be a, a founder of AIME also. They walked from Allentown to where it was proposed to erect a new furnace. They paid a toll and crossed the Lehigh Canal at Byers Bridge and produced, proceeded to a town called Byers Port. In front of that stone, ho stone hotel, they met with Frederick Breyer. He took them to see the land which he and his sons had sold to Lehigh Crane Ironworks. Construction of the furnace began in August, and the first run of iron was made in 4th of July in 1840. These are some pictures of, of that area, and one of the reasons I keep talking about Frederick Breyer is, by some accounts, some genealogists say that he's my third great-grandfather. I can't hardly believe it because I figure that when genealogists do, do any work at all, they always find somebody famous that you're, that, you, that you're related to. But I can find about half a dozen guys that are famous that I was related to, and I, I can't figure out how, I, how I'm not famous because of it. Uh, Samuel Thomas, the son of David, Spent four years working at his blacksmith and machine shops of the Lehigh Crane Works. To learn the business, and he took an active role in its management. At the age of 21, he helped erect uh, a start and start up an iron furnace of his own in New Jersey. He later became a superintendent of Thomas Iron Company, a separation from the Crane Iron Works, in 1854, and he became president in 1864. He organized the Lockridge Iron Company at Arboros, which was acquired by the Thomas Iron Company later. He developed mining properties for Lehigh Crane Iron Company. Samuel and his son Edward purchased mineral lands, built a blast furnace around Birmingham, Alabama, town of Thomas, Alabama. It was called the Pioneer Mining Company, Iron and Manufacturing Company. It was later sold to Republic Iron. I find it very hard to believe, but the only obituary I could find for Samuel Thomas is this one. Samuel Thomas died. He was the son of David Thomas. That's, I, 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 I find it very, very hard to believe, it, but that's the, the only obituary I could find in the newspaper. Stephen Betts Whitting was apprenticed as a machinist in Connecticut. At 17, at 23, he went to uh, Illinois as superintendent of the Illinois Iron Works. In 1860, he came back to New Jersey and became in charge of what was became Wilcox and Whitting. Nat Iron Works built a Civil War monitoring monitor, one of the boats like 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 the monitor in Merrimack that, that famous in the battle. There were a number of those were built. One of those was built by by Whitting. In Philadelphia. Later on, he also built the superstructure for the Chestnut Street Bridge, which had been described as one of the handsomest, strongest, and largest bridges in the country. That bridge still stands today. Whitting went to Pottsville in 1865 as superintendent of Snyder's Colliery Ironworks, which became later on became part of Reading Company. 
He designed a winning system of rope driving, hauling, and hoisting machinery, which was first installed at the Ashley Plains. The uh, system also was adopted on the Mahanoy Plains on other, uh, at the Brooklyn Bridge, at the Red Jacket, which was also called the winning shaft of the Calumet Hecla Mining Company, and for South African diamond mines. A lot of, a lot of deep mines were used, used that system for, for, for rope, rope, haul, rope lifting. When he went to Pottsville as superintendent of Slayer, like I said, he went to Pottsville in 1865 as superintendent of Slayer's Colliery Ironworks. In 1878, Whitting was employed by the Philadelphia and Reading Cold Iron Company as a mechanical engineer. He was promoted to chief engineer in 1880 and 1883 to general manager. He moved to Michigan in 1888 as general manager to Calvin and Hecla Mining Company. He served as general manager until 1901 when he retired. He was also a charter member of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Morgan Bradley Williams was born in Wales, worked in the mines there as a child, became your boss of the mines at, eight, at 16. At 25, he migrated to Australia to search for gold. And after some decent success, at 31, he came to Northeast Pennsylvania. He worked for 14 years as foreman at Hollenbach Mine of the Lehigh and Wilkes-Barre Coal Company and was one of the founders of the Red Ash Coal Company with two other founders of AIME. Active in public affairs and politics, he was elected to the state as a state senator in 1884, replacing Eckley Cox. He was involved with several Wyoming Valley Enterprises, the Wilkes-Barre Deposit and Savings Bank, the Wilkes-Barre Electric Railway Company, and West Pittston Manufacturing Company. He became one of the most successful and influential Welshmen in the state. James Pryor Williamson was the first treasurer of AIB. He was born in Baltimore. He was a nephew of Thomas Wilson, the owner of the Pioneer Cotton Factory and Baltimore Coal Company. Baltimore Coal Company was a pretty f famous business here, here, here in northeastern Pennsylvania. At the outbreak of the Civil War, Williamson enlisted in the Con Confederate Army. But Wilson, persu Wilson persuaded him to resign and sent him to north to look over, over the Baltimore Company business in Pennsylvania. Williamson went into retail and banking business in Wilkesbury. He married well to a daughter of a pioneer of, of northeastern Pennsylvania and a member of the Woodward and Butler families. Williamson was a mason of Westerman at St. James Episcopal, a foreman of the fire company, and active in society and part of the clique that involved, included a number of other founders of, a, of AIME, Swear and Charles Parrish, other coal bigwigs, and law, lawyers, bankers, and politicians, it was called the Crackers and Cheese Club. There's a, a picture of the mem members of the Crackers and Cheese Club in 1869. Uh, Charles Parrish in the back, uh, one of the founders of AIME. Uh, Williamson in front. Uh, Swear next to the right, right on the bottom. And uh, the next man next to him, uh, Hoyt, was a, a governor of, of Pen later to be a governor of Pennsylvania. Kind of high society. As, as you could might guess, since we're doing these in alphabetic order, William Dwight Zayner is probably the last guy in this group. William Z Dwight Zayner worked for the Lehigh Coal Navigation Company. The Lehigh Coal Navigation Company owned 8,000 acres of mine property between Machunk and Tamaqua. It's called the Panther Creek Valley. I worked there for, for 25 years. In 1871, Zayner was a superintendent of the Room Run and Lansford Mines of the LCN. 1881, he advanced to general superintendent of the company's 10 collieries and employed 3,300 men. He might not have been president of the company, but the company owned Lansford and the Valley, and Zayner was the boss of everything. When he retired, actually he was asked to retire in 18, 1906, 
He was superintendent of the collieries in the Lans Lansford, Lansford Tamaco Railway, the Electric Light Works, the Water Company, the Railroad, and the Car Shops. You can't get away from a cock about the anthracite region without a story about the Molly Maguires. And I got to say that Zaner's is a pretty good one. Morgan Powell, who was killed by the Mollies in 1871, and John P. Jones, who was killed in 1875, were both assistant superintendents under Zaner. Both murders were supposedly done to get him run away. In 1871, Powell was on his way to Zaner's office when he was shot. Zaner was later warned that Mollies planned to murder Jones and himself. Charles Parrish, his boss, had given instructions to spare no expense to secure their safety, and Jones had been sleeping at Zaner's house guarded by the coal and iron cops. But on September 2nd, Jones slept at his own house for the first time in several weeks and was shot as he returned to Zaner's home. So that's my story for today. I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have. I have good news and bad news. The bad news is they're gonna, there's more to talk about. And I'm going to talk about them all again soon. The good news is there's only 16 more. And there's another bad news, and that's I, I've written all, almost a book about each one of them. So I'm looking forward to, to talking to you again in the not-too-distant future about those 16 guys. <laughs>